is Rosemary Ingraham, and I come to you this morning from Arrowwood to lead your worship service. And we'll start our service with the lighting of the cross. We light this candle to remind us that in dawn's early light, in the noonday sun, and in the moon glow at night, Jesus is the light of the world and is always with us. And I ask you to join with me in the call to worship. God of light, rising each new day, you gather us together in worship. You gather us to hear your good news. Be in the heart of our living singing. You gather us to see the risen Christ. Be in the heart of our seeing. You gather us to send us out in faith. Be in the heart of our serving.
used to the idea that there are some people who are going to follow this service online, so I say welcome to those folks as well. And I'm going to ask you now to join with me in the gathering prayer. In wonder and awe, we come before you, merciful God, seeking to learn from your word, asking for healing for our souls, that we might be prepared to serve you in whatever way we can, serve you and others in this time of worship. Fill us with your spirit. Amen. We have no children here this morning, but uh, I guess it's a story time for all ages. So I hope you can see, I'm just going to show you some things that I have in this bag. If the children were here, we'd be, I'd be sitting down with them and letting them look at them as well. So I'll hold each of them up for you. This is a piece of fake fur, some rick rack, a nice bright silky purple ribbon, piece of green linen and a piece of red felt and a bright silky yellow ribbon and I've got to lay down at the bottom of this day I have some silver buttons but they're quite large buttons it's hard for me to hold them up there. And they're, they're kind of, they've got a, a raised front on them. So I have a yellow zipper. I've got a piece of lace. Some red plaid taffeta. Some denim. A piece of upholstery material. And the last thing that's in this bag is a pocket. This is cut from a pair of old coveralls. Now, who would like to hazard a guess as to what we could do with all those different things? <laughs> well, that's where my story is. I borrowed this book from the library one day, and it's called What I Learned from God While Quilting. And I, I had been working on this service and wondering what I could do for the, uh, part, for the story for all ages. And when this little story popped out at me, you know, it's one of those serendipity moments, or it's is that just a coincidence, or was somebody tapping me on my heart, saying, this is the story to tell? And the name, the story is called The Touch of the Quilt. Imagine a quilt with zippers, buttons, pockets, lace, and rickrack. In neon color, its neon colors scream at you, and its wild prints make you dizzy. Perhaps it's too bold for your home decor, too intense for your guest bed. But for a visually impaired child, it's perfect. Quilts for Carrying Hands, QCH, in Corvallis, Oregon, heard about the need for such quilts, and their reaction was immediate. Our hands were in the air volunteering almost before the question was completed, says Jean, June Nelson, one of the members. This dedicated group of women has focused on charity work since 1990, making bed, bed covers for children at risk, including babies of teens, including babies of teens' mothers, those in foster care, and those suffering from abuse. A couple of years after they formed the group, they became involved with the visually impaired. 
When making these quills, QCH members deviate from standard cotton materials and choose fabrics according to texture and color only. Their quilts might contain silks, satins, fake fur, seersucker, and wool, June says. We use as many different textures as possible so a blind child's fingers learn to refine the sense of touch. We use bright neon colors and blacks, whites, reds, yellows, colors with high contrast. Our print patterns are bold and gaudy. For a child with limited sight, these stimuli help work the eye muscles. Through quilts, children learn to explore their environment in a safe, non-threatening setting. Some of the quilt tops feature rip-rack and other embellishments, along with pockets to hold squeaky toys. The baggies, in contrast, are solid colors. This allows the caregiver to turn the quilt over and place an object on it, inviting the child to focus his limited vision on this one thing. Besides serving as teaching tools, the quilts also give blind infants something to occupy their minds. Sighted children, when awake, are constantly watching the world around them. But blind children don't have that option. If they have a quilt, though, their hands can explore, can explore it when they're alone in the crib or playpen. The usefulness of these quilts goes beyond the child affecting physical therapists and parents as well. Mary Reed, coordinator of Vision Services for William Ed Educational Service District in Salem, says the quilts speak of caring. They tell parents and specialists that they're not alone. There are others who care and want to walk by their side. The blankets from QCH are a reminder of this carry. These women, she says, are a gift from heaven. Thanks to them and their wild quilts, dozens of blind children in Oregon have a jump start on learning. And each one of these little stories has, at the end of it, a little section called the quilting frame. And this is what it says. If we have become blind to the activity of God in our lives, we may need to add texture to our faith. When intimate moments with God are only a testimony of years past, then it is time to pray for different ways to deepen our relationship with Him. Traditional rituals and activities lose their impact when they become predictable. God wants to walk with us daily to meet the needs of others in bolder, more caring, people-oriented ways that say, God loves you, and so do I. When this happens, you feel your faith again. And there's also something at the end called the binding stitch, and this is what it says, Lord, Keep me from being idle and unfaithful, and bring me into the full knowledge of who you are. Right. Right.
reading to, to you this morning from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, starting at verse 46 to 52. They came to Jer Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside, baby. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. Up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I am going to read another short scripture to you as well. It's not listed in your bulletin this morning, but it's from Matthew. And it's the section about the sheep and the goats, where the sheep are put on the right and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for the one of the least of my brothers of mine, you did for me. This is the word of our sacred story. Thanks be to God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. A minister from Kentucky tells this story about herself and then relates it to the story of Bartimaeus. As a young girl, she had a vivid memory of walking on a downtown street when a ragged man shuffled up to her, handed her a pencil, and thrust an empty cup into her face. She was scared, so she gave him back the pencil, and she hurried away as fast as she could. Her father, who worked downtown, later explained to her that the man was harmless. He was simply a man down on his luck and looking for a handout. Many of us have had similar experiences, even if we don't want to admit it. We become adept at waving away the panhandlers, avoiding eye contact with the beggars, and stepping around the homeless. We become numb to the daily doses of misery on the evening news. We drive past public housing, homeless shelters, and prisons without pondering the misery and pain crouching behind the walls. In short, the drama of Bartimaeus is played out a million times a day. The crowd marches by and does not see the man beside the road. One wonders who was truly sightless in the story. 
blind Bartimaeus or the unseen crowd. Even when Bartimaeus cried out for help, the crowd hushed his disturbing voice. Ironically, their eyes were so firmly fixed on Jesus that they entirely overlooked the man in need of healing. But Jesus didn't overlook Bartimaeus. He never lost the ability to see people in need, whether hungry or sick or downtrodden. He was not too busy to stop for a man in need. To be sure, we cannot do all the wonders that Jesus did, and we cannot heal every hurt, but we can learn to see. Seeing alone does not always help, but there can surely be no help without seeing. Mark includes an interesting detail in his story. He tells us that Bartimaeus came to Jesus after throwing off his cloak. Some commentators believe that the blind wore a particular kind of garment, a hooded cloak designed to hide the upper part of the face. By wearing a cloak that covered the eyes, the blind could move through the crowds without making others feel uncomfortable. The world hasn't changed much. We are still uncomfortable with pain and the disability of others. Sometimes we compensate by putting people out of sight who make us uneasy. The brain damaged, the emotionally troubled, the seriously ill. Or we look the other way, pretending they aren't in our path. Bartimaeus apparently senses that Jesus is a man that he can approach with uncovered eyes, unhidden pain, and undisguised need. He throws off the cloak of politeness and comes barefaced to Jesus. And for his part, Jesus meets him as a fully human being, face to face, eye to eye. In that meeting, Bartimaeus is fully seen, and this is the beginning of his healing. William McKinley served in Congress before he was elected the 25th President of the United States. And on his way to his congressional office one morning, he boarded a streetcar and took the only remaining seat. Minutes later, a woman who appeared to be ill boarded the car, and unable to find a street, she clutched an overhead strap directly in front of one of McKinley's colleagues. The other congressman hid behind his newspaper and did not offer the woman his seat. McKinley walked up the aisle, tapped the woman on the shoulder, and gave her his seat, and he took her place in the aisle. Years later, when McKinley was president, this same congressman was recommended to him for a post as an, an ambassador to a foreign nation. McKinley refused to appoint him. He feared a man who hid behind his paper and didn't have the courtesy to offer his seat to a sick woman on a crowded streetcar would lack the courtesy and sensitivity to be an ambassador in a troubled nation. The disappointed congressman bemoaned his fate to many in Washington, but never did learn why McKinley chose someone else for the position. Ralph Milton, in his book, Sermon Seasoning, says this about men. And just a caveat here, I wrote this before the uh, municipal elections of, of this past week, where a, a, quite a number of women have been voted into offices throughout our province in various places. So 
what he says may be, maybe he would have worded it a little different, but anyhow, this is what he says. Men generally do better at things involving muscle bulk, eye-hand coordination, and rational, logical, left-brained calculations. Women most often do better at understanding human relationships and at communicating ideas and concepts. Thus he said, when he and his wife Bev went out for an evening with friends, she picked up on all kinds of subtle information that he didn't even notice. When it came to understanding other people, he said, he was perceptually challenged. Or, as they said in Jesus' day, he was born blind. He simply didn't see the hurt in people's eyes or the anger under the calm exterior, which, he says, if you think about it, given the number of men who are leaders in our public offices, that virtually all of our leaders are blind to the fundamental issues of human welfare. They can't see what it is that Jesus was making the fuss about. Show them an oppressed person, and they see an economic or political problem. They don't see a hurting human. It's no good yelling at them. They were born blind. Why does, which does not mean that they cannot be given sight. It takes a miracle, and miracles do happen. There are thousands of men and women who have learned to see or at least to trust the judgment of someone who can. Miracles are happening every day, and we can be and are part of those miracles. Just like the sensory quilts made by the quilts for caring hands brought joy and comfort to the children who were visually impaired, quilts that are given to street people or women's shelters or cancer patients are a reminder to these folks that we see them and are reaching out to help them any way we can. And the same can be said for taking a meal to someone or picking someone up to bring them to church or what, just small things. We're saying, I see you I, and I see a need and I'll, I'll try and fill that need. I listened to a news story just last Sunday on the CBC program called Our Calvary about an app that has been developed for blind people that allows them to hike on their own in areas all over Calgary, like Fish Creek Park. The folks who developed the app saw a need and did something about it. So I'm asking you this morning to look around you and where do you see a need and what can you do about it? Quite a number of years ago, over, over 20 years ago in fact, I wrote a, a poem or a, or a song uh, in response to a, a Lent study that we were doing on a book that was called Seeing is Believing. I turned it around and said, Believing is Seeing. And I'd like to share that with you this morning. Believing is seeing Jesus in bread and in wine. It's sharing the cup with all humankind. It's seeking his justice for all those oppressed. So all of creation is equally blessed. Believing is seeing Jesus in beggar and thief. It's hearing his voice in pain and in grief. It's seeing him in women and children abused, and in all those folks who are lonely and confused. Believing is hearing Jesus saying, go in my name, with compassion.
compassion and love heal the blind and the lame. It's sensing his presence and knowing he's there. It's feeling his touch in someone who cares. John Newton was born blind. He became a successful slave trader who saw the African people only as a commodity to be traded and used. Then, amazing grace burst into his life, and he was given the gift of sight. One day, Newton looked into the eyes of one of his slave cargo, and he saw a human being, a child of God. Years later, he wrote, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see.
and Mena never went to school. When she was just 10 years old, her father married her off to an older man. By 16, she had a child. A few years after the birth of her daughter, her husband died. When she returned to her maternal home, Mena was married off again. After a few years of marriage, Mena became a widow again. Single, she faced extraordinary stigma. Approximately 2.18 million single women like Mena live in the state of Rajasthan, Rajasthan, India. Whether they are widowed, divorced, or have never been married, these women are deemed incomplete and a disgrace to their families. As a result, many live lives marked by stigma, fear, and violence, simply for not being married. In 1986, the United Church of Canada partnered with Asta Sanston, an organization that empowers marginalized individuals to advocate for their needs. And 13 years later, in 1999, Asta Sanstan launched the Association of Strong Women Alone, which your mission and service gives support. Immediately, 450 single women joined, and 22 years later, today, there are more than 70,000 members. The Association of Strong Women Alone their approach is simple. Create a safe space for single women to come together and get the knowledge and skills necessary to improve their lives. The association has made all the difference for Mena. She can now read and write and is empowering other women to become literate. Because of her leadership, 35 women have enrolled in adult learning. All of them now have grade eight certificates. What's more, the generational cycle of illiteracy has been broken. Mena's daughter can not only read and write, but is also teaching others to do the same. Your mission and service gifts empower women like Mena to be agents of change within their communities. Thank you for your generosity. God has gifted us with abundance in so many ways. Let us share in that abundance through our gifts of time, talent, and treasures. In Jesus' name, amen. And the offering plates are out the back for your son. And we will sing.
us pray. Healing and compassionate God, we come before you this morning with eyes wide open to the many places and situations in our world that need healing. We pray for the people who are still struggling to get away from the violence and oppression in Afghanistan. We pray for the kidnapped victims in Haiti and those who are working for their release. We lift up all those who are ill and in hospital and all those health care workers who continue to work tirelessly throughout this pandemic. We give thanks for their dedication and the dedication of all frontline workers, whatever their job may be. We pray for families that have been torn apart by differing views around COVID. For those that have been elected to public office this past week, we ask that their eyes may be open to the needs of the communities and peoples they have been elected to serve, and that they will carry out their tasks with wisdom, compassion, and justice. We give thanks that we live in a country where we have the freedom to vote because there are many places in the world where this is not the case. We pray for the communities of which we are a part. We pray for families that lack stability, households in crisis, relationships in conflict. We pray for lives that are in anguish over illness, worry, or grief. Comfort all who are alone and help us to be a presence to them. Loving God, hear now those people, places, and situations that we need only in the silence of our hearts. we ask in the name of Jesus, the healer, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, now will be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever.
So may the peace of Christ be with you, and I ask that you uh, be mindful of uh, COVID restrictions as you greet those around you. <laughs>